Uh, right then. This is a big room. Okay, so every year, the University of Southampton runs something called the National Cipher Challenge, which invites pretty much anybody under the age of 18 to come and solve ciphers of varying degrees of difficulty. So it begins with really simple stuff, sort of Caesar ciphers and that, and it moves up to things that are slightly more difficult. Um, and the way it works is it runs for eight weeks, and each week you're given two ciphers to solve. Um, traditionally, the final week, week eight, the second cipher, so 8B, is um, much harder than any of the others to kind of test people who find the remainder a little more easy and kind of separate the, the good from the, the really, really good. I've, I don't, I've only ever done this once, I did it last year, uh, and it took me to places that I haven't been before. I did some things that I wasn't expecting to do, and I just kind of want to talk you through that because I found it interesting. I know other people have found it interesting, so hopefully you will too. So, before I do that, I just want to cover this because this is the thing that I find most people sometimes get confused with, which is the difference between breaking a cipher and decrypting a cipher. If I give you a piece of ciphertext that has been encoded and you have the key to, to, to bring it back to plain text and you use that key to bring it back to a piece of English, that's just decrypting. Very easy, you just follow a process, you use that key and you bring it back to a piece of plain text English. If you don't have that key, then you are breaking the cipher and it's much more difficult. We broke Enigma, you can break a Caesar cipher relatively easily, but if you don't have the key, what you're doing is breaking it. And that's what we need to do. So, we're gonna skip all of the other challenges, we're gonna go straight to task eight. Solitaire cipher, have anybody in here heard of a solitaire cipher? Oh, that's the first time that's ever happened. Okay then, so, yeah. So the solitaire cipher was invented by a guy called Bruce Schneier, who is actually an author. He wrote a book called Cryptonomicon, and he needed to create his own form of cipher. And he came up with this. It's quite simple on the face of it, and then you realize that it's not at all. So you use a pack of cards as the key. A pack of cards, it includes the two jokers as well. So there are 54 um, cards in this pack and it uses the order of that pack of cards as the key. So, 54 factorial, big number. Really, really big number. Big number. <laughs> to put it into context, if I was to try and brute force break this cipher, and if I could go through one trillion different decks of cards every second, I'd still be doing it if I started at the beginning of the universe. Big number. To put it into context even more, that's the number of different rotations in an Enigma machine. Enigma, pack of cards. So, the solitaire cipher is actually quite simple. You take a pack of cards that is in a specific order at the start and you shuffle it in a very, very specific way. I'll go through that in a minute. You then use what you end up with from that shuffle to encrypt a letter of your original piece of English. And then you repeat all the way through your message. So you shuffle, encrypt a letter. Shuffle, encrypt the next letter. And you carry on doing it until you've encrypted the entire thing. Except that the shuffle takes quite a few stages. So if you begin with a specific deck of cards in a specific order, you've got to move two jokers, you've got to do a cut that involves splitting it at the jokers and swapping things around, you've got to count through the deck of cards depending on what the first card is. Tons of different stuff. It's very specific but very complicated, which means that trying to recreate it is a pain. So, once you've done all that, it allows you to encrypt one letter and then you do that for each letter in your message. So if you started with what's called a standard deck of cards, this top one up here, which literally goes through ace of clubs down to joker B. So you're going ace through king of clubs, ace through king diamonds, ace through king of hearts, ace through king spades, joker A, joker B, one to 54. And you carry on shuffling it, you get these things, and these ones are are bold and underlined, they're your output cards, and they're the ones that 
decide what's, how your letter is going to be encrypted. Um, and as you can see, it starts to get very random very quickly. So, you shuffle, you encrypt, and then you repeat for your entire message. The key for the solitaire cipher is your standard deck. Just like in your key for a Caesar cipher, it's a number from 1 to 26. But your standard deck is what you require to decrypt this cipher. If you don't have the original deck that they started with, you have to break it. And as I already told you, breaking it requires plenty of time, more time than I have. So that's the number of things we've got to go through. But I give you a scenario. If you're trying to communicate to someone in secret with the solitaire cipher, you need a specific deck that you're going to communicate with. You have a few options here. You can either use one that's very easy to remember, like a standard deck where you just put it in order, but that's going to be the first one that someone checks if they're trying to decrypt it. So what other options do you have? Well, you could use one that's very similar to that, like it being backwards or swapping a few of the cards around, but there's still going to be obvious ones that people are going to use first. It's like using password as your password or one, two, three, four. It's just, it's, it's not very secure. Your other option is something completely random, but it's quite well known that pff, trying to remember an entire deck of cards in order is a mean feat for anyone who's got a decent memory, and it's not really going to happen, is it? So, what are you actually going to do if you're trying to use this cipher? Well, there's a, there's a decent method you can use, which is to key it in the first place with a word. You can use a word in the English language, and you can key the deck to begin with using that word. It's very similar to the shuffle. You just end up doing an extra cut with each letter in it. So you effectively do a shuffle for each letter in your keyword. There is a problem. That's the number of rotations of a deck of cards. That's the number of words in the English language. Suddenly, it becomes much easier to decrypt. We're not going to have to go through, or is it 2.3 times 10 to the 71? Ooh, fun. No, we're going through just over a million words in the English language. Much easier, much more viable. So if we're actually going to try and break this, whatever they're going to set us, we need to just key the deck with each word in the English language, decrypt it with that deck, and check to see if that is plain text English, and then repeat that up to a million times. How do you go about detecting English in Python? And this is the main part of the talk. This is the fun bit, because this is way more difficult than you may first imagine. It's, if you just think about it for a minute, there's a couple of ways you could go about doing this, and some of them work much better than others. So the first way you could go about doing it is, most people know E is the most common letter in the English language, and followed by sort of T, A, those sorts. And you don't get many Zs, and you don't get many Xs. So you can try and do it by letter frequencies. But if you're going through a million, just law of averages, you're going to get some that fit the frequencies that are not English. They're complete and utter mess of characters. It's just that if you use that method, they look like English, because they have the correct frequencies. So the way that seems to work for people is called n-grams, which is just effectively a string of letters of length n. You can use whatever length you want. The one that people generally go for is trigrams, three. Um, so if I took the phrase the cipher challenge and I took its trigrams, you'll notice that the trigrams go across words. So the is the first one, but then you've got H-E-C and then E-C-I. We don't care about spaces. They can go across words. And these groups of letters, some of them crop up much more often than others. Much more often. The problem is there's many different trigrams. You've got one letter in the alphabet, 26, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, and you've got to choose one for each position, so 26 cubed. There's over 17,000 of these, which means that for each trigram you get, there's a very low possibility that's actually going to turn up in the message you're trying to do. So if you build a way of rating a piece of text on how English it is, you can do it with trigrams using the most common trigrams that you can find on Wikipedia, and that's no problem. But it takes three days to run. It was a long weekend. 
So I ran it, it worked beautifully, but it's not viable for the Cypher challenge. I can't turn up on a Wednesday afternoon as they release challenge eight and wait three straight days for my program to decrypt it. I'm just going to lose. And I'm going to lose really badly. So here's what I realized. A Cypher challenged message that I've got to decrypt, break, sorry, I've got to break, is usually around 200 to 300 characters. But I've got to find the keyword, and I don't have to find the keyword using all 300 characters they give me. If I could just analyze the first 20 or the first 30, then it'll run faster, right? So if I can just make it so that this English rating works effectively, not on 200 to 300 characters, but just 20 or 30, then I will directly speed up my program. If I reduce the number of characters I'm analyzing by 10 times, then I will make my program 10 times faster. So I've just got to make my English rating much more efficient and much better. So there's just over 17,000 trigrams, which means that each time I find a trigram, its frequency on the grand scale of things isn't very large anyway. So just the most common ones, even though they are common, they still don't turn up that often. There's loads of them. Bigrams are the same thing, but only two letters. That means that there are only 676, 26 squared, which means that the most common bigrams turn up all the time. The most what common one is TH, and it's all over the place. I'm saying it all the time. In the English language, you will find the letters T and H next to each other, just like one, one in every three words. It's, it's all over the place. So. If we're trying to detect English using bigrams, you're going to do a lot better. And it means that for a shorter length of text, you are going to get a more accurate result. You can factor in other methods to just get rid of the ones that are clearly not English. So you could say, if there are no E's in it, it's clearly not English. And if you've got eight consonants in a row, it's clearly not English. And only then you go on to bigram analysis, and you can vastly speed up how fast you can tell whether a string of 20 characters or 30 characters is in plain text English. So first one, clearly not in English, there's no E's. So that one's nice and easy. Gets an English rating of zero. Bang, done. Second one. Clearly not in English, because you've got, what, like eight characters there that are all consonants, so gets a rating of zero. Bang, done. Third one, looking pretty promising, except that, again, we've got eight letters in a row, and they're all consonants, and there's no, so there's no vowels, so that one gets zero. Fourth one fits all of the first few criteria. It's got plenty of E's, it's got plenty of vowels, no eight consonants in a row. But if we do a bigram analysis on it, it doesn't have many common bigrams relative to its length. And so it only ends up with a rating of eight. That's what it turns out of. Generally, I'd say English gets a rating of 100 or over. What I ended up doing is this isn't an English rating. It's an Alice in Wonderland rating. I had to analyze some large piece of plain text English to get the bigrams in order of how common they are. And the first one I could come up with was I typed in Alice in Wonderland.txt on on Google and just got a big fat file of Alice in Wonderland and just analyzed all of its biograms. So interestingly, the phrase the cipher challenge gets a rating of 143, but the first few words of Alice in Wonderland get fewer. So could something be more Alice in Wonderland than Alice in Wonderland? But that's a whole different topic, which would be fun, maybe next year. Um, right, so let's try and see if this works. How long have I got? I have no idea. Plenty of time. Good. Right. Um, this is something online that can encrypt and decrypt solitaire ciphers. It's no use to me because it only does one at a time, and if I tried to do a million with this, it would take me years. But it is good as a third-party thing to test that mine works. Oops, sorry. So let's just use the phrase the cipher challenge, but I need a volunteer. I want a word in the English language preferably near the beginning so it doesn't take too long because I've got to go through them all. So beginning with A, B, or C would be great, but we're going to encrypt this. Any word. Last time I did this, they chose Cardiff, and that's a proper noun, and that was very embarrassing when it didn't crop up. But just any word, beginning with preferably A, B, or C, because then it doesn't take too long. Baboon. Pardon? Baboon. Baboon? OK. Baboon. Yeah. That's correct, right? Not double B. 
Not with double B. Good, right. Okay. Here we go. So this is just third party encryption with a solitaire cipher, keyword baboon. So if we stick this in here, there's the encryption. How many characters is that? 19. Good. So we've got to see if we can decrypt that with every single word in the English language and tell that baboon is the one that we encrypted it with. Please work, because if it doesn't, it's going to be really embarrassing. It's just going to be a repeat of last time. Can you see that all right? Uh, right. Oh, by the way, this is conch. It's a thing of beauty, and you should all be using it. That's not me. That's my dad. Uh, right. So every time you see a word come up, that's uh, one, th no, 10,000 words that it's gone through. I didn't want it to go print all of the words in the English language, but each time one comes up, that means it's the 10,000th and so on. Oh, I really want this to work. Please work. So just think for each one of them, 10,000 words, each one is keying a deck, then decrypting it with that keyed deck. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yes. Brilliant. There we go. So. I only wanted you to choose baboon because clearly it goes through an alphabetical order, and if you chose xylophone, I'd be here for a while. Right. That's pretty much all I wanted to do. I've gone through this a lot quicker than I was expecting, so it, I sh should be able to take any questions if you want them. <laughs> How long was that? Do I want to what? I can't hear you. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Tom? If you do, please go to the queue. So did you succeed at the challenge? I did, but not in the way I'd have wanted to. So the Cypher challenge ended up throwing a bit of a curveball. They didn't key the deck, they didn't key the deck with a keyword. What they did is they faked some whole scenario, because it, it's all done on a storyline, and what they said was, ooh, we found a textbook nearby that had a pack of cards in it, but it was slightly burned, so we could only see 43 of the cards, which was a bit of a curveball, which meant I kind of had to ad-lib ad it. But we did get there in the end. I think it took us about 36 hours to do eventually. Um, I think we came in the top, 2%. We got to go to the, the celebration thing at the end. The winners get, it's sponsored by Trinity College Cambridge and IBM, and the winners get um, prizes from them. But yeah, we, we did really well. We came top 2%, but we did not win, which was annoying because threw a bit of a curveball, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, up, the upshot was I got to use Python to try and detect English, which it turns out. I did it in a different way to some people, and I've had some people come in and asking questions. Some guy asked me once uh, if I could try and use low entropy text to detect not only English, but just language in general, to which I kind of stood there and just went, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Right. We, have, we do have time for a, a few more questions, but we're also coming up to the lunch break. So unless someone has a burning question right now, let's thank Thomas one last time. Thanks.